Rolling again. We're rolling again. We did a whole podcast and then Joe Biden and- dropped out. <laughs> <laughs> what? You're just going to jump right into it. This is the yeah. new beginning of the podcast. Are we starting again? I thought we were just going to tack it on. Yeah, we are going to tack it on. So right. uh, we just shot a really, I thought, phenomenal It was podcast. the perfect podcast. It was perfect. We talked about Best the- Best podcast out- there ever was. <laughs> <laughs> the fallout from the assassination. And that's all coming. Yeah. So keep listening. But as soon as we hit stop, Brennan called me and said, Joe Biden dropped out, which- I've been predicting for like a year. Everybody's been predicting it. I'm going to say I was predicting it. You predicted it first? Oh, yeah. You got an inside scoop? <laughs> no. it. Um, the most cynical take on this, I think, is this is, and I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's cynical. I'm very cynical. I that know. this is an attempt by the Democratic Party to avoid a primary process, mm-hmm. that this was the plan all along. And that you don't run the risk of a Bernie Sanders or a disruptor coming up through a primary process. And if RFK. you can just and and RFK. Yeah. If you can just have Biden drop out at the last second. Um, he didn't immediately do it, but has since sent a follow up tweet. This oh yeah, is the he world had we're living in. This. Um, endorsing Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris. Yes. Kamala. So we can, I guess, take from that that the establishment's pick is. Kamala. Kamala. Well, here's the thing is neither of them were very popular in 2020. No. Someone pointed this out that... um, Our boy's here. He's not here for the whole rest of the podcast. Yeah. Someone pointed out that Biden was fifth and Kamala wasn't even ranking in the 2020 primary, presidential primary. That's how they got into power. And then there was a a sneaky behind-the-scenes Democrat play, which they do, which pushed Bernie out. Who was at the top, who was who was set to win if all of the moderates didn't drop. Yeah, and so all of the moderates dropped and put their weight behind Biden, but Elizabeth Warren stayed in and split the progressive wing. Mm -hmm. So basically, it became Biden, not because he was the most popular. But from gamesmanship. Yeah, and he chose Kamala as his backup, as his vice president, even though she was not doing well at all. Right. So people are very upset. And, they, and uh, you know, again, the most cynical take and the right wing take is that Kamala was chosen because she was a woman. She was black. There well, he is, said it. She Joe is Biden a woman. Said it. She is black. And yeah, he did say he that said he was it. going to. That's not to a pick. cynical take. That's right. what exactly what he said. He's going to choose a black woman, which, if you're going to do it, don't talk about it. Yeah, just do it. Say this is the best person for. And we get into this in the the next little bit of yeah. the podcast. Um, you wanted to talk about how this actually will play out now. And yeah, by the a, rules. The there rules. rules. There are rules. So according to the Washington Post, um, now that Biden has dropped out, there is no longer a chosen candidate. Basically, he had, through the quote-unquote primary process where he was the only one running, Joke. really, uh, he had gained all of the delegates needed to have a majority. Therefore, we would go into the Democratic Convention All those delegates secured, no question on who the candidate's going to be, right? Now that he doesn't have those delegates, they don't immediately go to Kamala Harris, even though she is the vice president. Mm -hmm. It is still considered, it's not considered an open convention yet, because what can happen is that all those delegates that were pledged to Biden, enough of them could pledge their support to Harris. They have decided, the Democratic Party has, even before this, decided to do a virtual vote before the convention, because Ohio had a deadline uh, for getting on their ballot yeah. uh, that was before the convention. They have since... Part of Ohio. Right. Ohio has since fixed that, yeah. um, and now they have to basically know who their nominee is and put them on the ballot before the end of August. Democratic convention is August like 19th. Mm, interesting. Right. The ways. So they were always going to do this virtual vote. So it is possible that they'll do the virtual vote. Enough delegates will say, we're behind Kamala Harris. We'll go into the convention as if she was Joe Biden. That could very well happen. But what is also possible is that that does not happen. The virtual vote does not give us a clear winner. And they go into the convention and we essentially op- enter an open convention. So the way that works is if you would like to, it basically becomes a mini primary with the delegates that are like chosen, uh, the people who vote as uh, surrogates for 
big groups of people. So this is not democratic at all. I mean, you could make the argument that it is. It's, this is more of a republic, right? It's I a, suppose. It's a republic, right? These delegates are supposedly chosen amongst Democratic voters to go and represent Democratic voters. Who chooses these people? I didn't vote I didn't get into people. that. I didn't get into that. I'm sure it's a process. Um, I think it's local elections in like certain positions, like uh, local certain local positions. I think you oh, become so you a had delegate. to be up in the Democratic Party beforehand. I believe so. Oh, don't bunch hold of me. Nerds. Don't hold me to that. So yeah. these thousands of delegates go. Um, if you would like to be in the contention for become, say Gretchen Whit- Whitaker or whatever wants to Whitmer, be right. Whitmer, yeah. wants to be the president, she will try to get. Uh, it has to be 300 delegates to pledge their support to her. 50, only 50 can come from one state. So she can only get 50 from Michigan. She'd have to get another 50 from California and another 10 from Georgia, whatever, to make up 300. Once you get to 300, you become a contender and you get into the vote, right? So they'll do a first round of voting. If that doesn't give a majority to one candidate, okay, because it'll probably be a half dozen or a dozen that are vying for the position. Yeah. Um, if after the first round there's no majority, they do some debating, some talking and talk it out. And then in the second vote, super delegates can vote. So super delegates are like former presidents and high ranking. Chosen by the party. I remember those in 2016. Yeah. They, they had pledged for Clinton before Bernie even opened his mouth to speak. Correct. Yes. All of them. So you, in the second round, now there's, you know, Super delegates come Super delegates play. come into play, but if after the second round, there's no clear winner, they do this again and again and again. And I think in 1925 or something, they did like 109 rounds of voting. So it could get very interesting. But what's wow. very interesting is they have to have a decision by the end of August. So to, to get on like Ohio's ballot and a couple other states. Mm-hmm. Ohio's a big, big state. Right. That's a, You only really vote for president if you live within like 10 states. Right. The rest of us, our state is just going to be blue all the time or red all the time. It doesn't make a difference. Yeah. We're in the doesn't make a difference camp, so we really have no stake in any of this. Now, what's floating around since yesterday, apparently Alex Jones uh, has predicted that the Democratic Party is, has decided to run Hillary Clinton again. I don't know where that comes from. We haven't had time to <laughs> oh, Alex that. Jones said so. Hell yeah. Alex and, Jones uh, pulled that out of his rear. <laughs> we have very quickly been flipping through our different media sources, uh, trickling all the way down to just some really dumb and horrible. Whatever is on Rumble. Rumble commentators. Because we're, we're going from respectable all the way down to the bottom of Rumble. <laughs> just, just Rumble live streams. what people streams. are saying. A lot of people are watching these live streams. It's like, yeah. what, are, what are people saying about this? And the, people predicted that Biden's going to drop out. And they say Harris. Harris has the money stashed, yeah. apparently. Yeah. So it's like $100 million. Yeah, there's, a, there's over $100 million of pledged donations to the campaign. Which will be inherited by Harris because she is currently part of the Biden administration. If she isn't the nominee, supposedly all that money goes away. However, I'm sure if you get enough lawyers in a room, they can figure something out. Well, it's but it also, doesn't go away. It goes back to the donors, it goes and then back they, to can donors. they can re-donate. They can re-donate it if but, they please. Yeah, but it, at that point, we're at the end of August, and it's going to, you know, that's when well, do we vote in November? Probably, yeah, we, we vote in November. They'll probably send something out that's like, if you would like to pass this along to the current uh, nominee, just click this button. And most right. people will just click the button. Right. So it'll be easy for them. I don't see that our founding fathers, I know we like to deify them, I don't see that they ever planned that they'd have to deal with super PAC legalese <laughs> in picking a president. So the fact that Kamala has this war chest of funds is so anti-American. It's actually really offensive. Yeah, I mean, I don't think our founding fathers expected anything. They didn't like predict the point. phone. They didn't yeah. predict TV or radio. There's a lot of stuff they didn't get. Yeah, so. and like you said, we're the only country that I can think of that like deifies their founding fathers. That's all we got. We don't have a unified religion. We got like Ben Franklin, who may may have been a serial killer. There's not enough evidence to say one way or the There's other. There's only one little bit of evidence that he like, might. Have people got bodies in the basement. You don't know about nothing. Anyway, you could dive into past episodes to to learn about that. Um, I will say I was uh, very upset we didn't get a primary season. It's something that I get really into and nerdy about. I'm relieved. But this is better. 
Yeah, well, this is going to be interesting. This is going to be like a quick mini series. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we don't need the full three seasons of this. I will point out why we can't become so cynical that we don't pay attention to politics anymore. Uh-huh. Okay. So I'm reading Modern Times, as we will deal with later. And the one thing he points out is that the German people decided on Hitler because they got tired of dealing with politics. Ah, uh, yes. They just you got did, tired of dealing with You said that the other day, yeah. Yeah. When Tony comes in from the outside, whatever he's doing, I just bombard him about facts from the 20th <laughs> century, 20th century history. He's like, sure, bae, whatever. But the German people kind of just gave their po polit political system political minds over to Hitler because they were like, I don't want to deal with it. I'm sick of this. I'm sick of it. It's unbecoming of a German. What's the worst he could do? And I don't want to say, I hate all the comparisons to Hitler, but that is a pretty, uh, that's a pretty foreboding uh, similarity that I see. I think I see a lot of people who are just like, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with it. Which is funny because this is why I say it's so anticlimactic. Uh -huh. It's that Donald Trump gave a speech at the RNC. That is, yes. that, that It was awful. The biggest ball drop in the history. And actually very revealing of his of, of his how psyche. Donald Trump thinks. Yes. Because he recounted the event and he's going on about things that we already know about. Right. He basically like watched the video and then told us what the video <laughs> like, was. Yeah. If I had attempted to assassinate you and you had yeah. to give a speech to like literally everybody in America is going to eventually watch the replay of the speech or parts of it. Yeah. I would imagine you would tell me how you felt about it, how it made you feel, yeah. the fear that ran through you and the ramifications that you think it may have on the country or what it says about the country. Mm -hmm. Those are interesting things. Yeah. What he did is he went up and he literally narrated a video. <laughs> literally, I stood on a stage. There were people in the crowd. A bullet whizzed past my... Like, the nuts and bolts of watching the video, he just described what happened. No, and this is really interesting. Assuming that he wrote the speech, which we don't know he did, but I, I think he did because it was a terrible speech. It was awful. Yeah, well, so they, they say they say that there was a much tighter, much better speech in the prompter and that he just didn't stick to the speech. He just started riffing. He just went into... Uh, All right. So whoever wrote this narration, it showed... If this is Donald Trump, or at least putting uh, his ideas into words, it shows that he thinks on a very animalistic level. Right. He doesn't think deeply in anything. He's just basically saying what happened. And we were talking about this earlier. I wonder if this is how people with no inner monologue understand <laughs> Maybe, the world. Maybe, yeah. Because I mean, it's sociopathic thinking, I think. I don't think it's sociopathic. I just think, remember we had this discussion a few weeks ago about people who have no inner monologue? And someone like me, I'm constantly thinking about things. I'm overthinking things. Sure. And I have had to train myself to pull that back. Like, I had to train myself to act on instinct. Yeah. Doing this podcast is difficult because we both just shoot off into like, that makes me think of this and that yeah. makes me think of this. Yeah. He doesn't do that. He doesn't think of anything, <laughs> which is fantastic because if you need to act immediately, mm -hmm. and we see this with maybe, maybe we're speculating. We see this with Stormy Daniels. We see this with how he approaches women, how he approaches life. He's not thinking of the consequences of his actions. Right. He's not thinking of this, of how this might affect the ones he loves, assuming he loves anybody. He's thinking about <laughs> how... Can I fulfill my need right now? Right. Which which is uh, hats off to him. According to the New York Post, Trump tore up a pre-written RNC speech and wrote his own personal remarks for the convention. Uh, so yeah, I think that did come from him. And everybody, <laughs> and a lot of the right media is trying to spin it as not spin it. They're presenting it as uh, like New York Post. Donald Trump delivers heartfelt and harrowing RNC address, calling for unity. Now, it is interesting that he didn't take – I honestly expected a fiery, this is this is what they do uh, on the left. They try to take out their opponents. This uh, Yeah, we he need could have to... really gone full, uh, full villain on this. Right, and he didn't, which is interesting. But the more interesting thing is he doesn't apparently feel anything about anything ever. Which is very funny. No, that is an asset. Not for him because he's so lacking in all other areas. Yeah. But just being able to act. If someone can convince him that this is the right way to act, he'll just do what is necessary. Right. Like Obama said he's not an ideologue. 
So you're like, what are we dealing with? Because people who overthink things, which is the class that is critical of him, yeah. are projecting all of these uh, ideas onto him. Like, oh, he has this conservative this. He's going to do Project 2025. Yeah. Once he found out Project 2025 wasn't popular, he turned against <laughs> it in know. a heartbeat. And he again, it, think, he doesn't feel. He's not he about anything. He doesn't know or believe anything. Oh, it's that fantastic. needs to be the line about Donald Trump. The, the left gets it so wrong when yeah. they try to paint him as somebody who believes or thinks anything about anything no, not at all apparently literally the thing he almost gets assassinated and apparently this this cultural movement that is built behind him would have crumbled you would think and he has nothing to say about it he has nothing to say like well i it would have been you know th they're trying to stop our vision for america he doesn't have a vision for america obviously. other people say things they put this on him and honestly the the 2025 thing project 2025 is a heritage foundation like letter that outlines their goals once they have the political ability to do it. Yeah. And it's not, this isn't built around Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the opportunity to institute yeah. these things, right? So the left for a long time was pointing the, pointing at this thing and saying like, this is why he can, this is why he is a direct threat to democracy because of Project 2025. But he doesn't know what it means. Well, he found out, and then he found out it wasn't popular. So now right. he's like, "Screw 2025, right?" And the crowd's like, "Boo, 25!" It's like, well, "All right, yeah." Which good? And it is. Good. It is crazy. Like the Project 2025 thing is crazy, but the Heritage Foundation has always been crazy. Yeah. And yeah, listening to had, that guy and talk, they may. Yeah. Because he apparently just likes people who flatter him. Yeah. So if the right people flatter him at the right time, they may get they may get what they want. Right, which is what makes him both dangerous and less dangerous than he could be mm -hmm. because he's literally just going to make whoever's in the room with him happy. Like, that that's just who he is. He doesn't yeah. act, again, know or believe anything. So if you can get close enough to him and convince him that it will be good for him personally, yeah, then you're, you're probably good. And it's a missed opportunity that somebody didn't get close enough to him and be like you know what people really like healthcare reform <laughs> <laughs> like let's get let's figure this out yeah because you know who what businesses hate paying for healthcare for yeah. their employees mm -hmm. you know what employees hate paying for healthcare that their employers are supposed to be paying for like that it is such a missed opportunity that somebody couldn't get close enough to him to do that because they keep painting him as a villain, and he's not. Well, he's he a wants, moron. Yeah, he wants to hang out with rich people, and what do rich people want? Now, I'm not saying he doesn't have any uh, views at all that are his own, especially business views. Sure, but and like see who's, what? See who he's hanging out with? Make more money. Yeah, make more money. Right. Make and more money. That's I business. don't fully disagree with him on like certain tariff things that he says. Like I, I don't. Again, absolutely. I don't know, but us importing fewer plastic garbage. Items from around the world, I don't think would be bad. We should make our own plastic garbage. Right. right Let's here. start making our own plastic junk. And if that junk is more expensive, good. Stop. But I don't mean, need yeah. so much of it. Eventually, we're going to have to transfer. We're going to have to transcend this capitalist system. I just don't know what the next thing is because, yeah, we don't need all this crap. Right. And again, Baron is who you need to be afraid of because Baron is, if you're writing a movie, yeah. Baron's the main character. This is the pro this is the prologue. Baron's the guy because Baron if is he's we don't know if he's ideological. He could be he could be like his mother and just like, "Yo, how do I look today? How much money do I have?" <laughs>